Have you ever had a moment in your life where you plopped down on your couch, stared blankly at your TV or high-end gaming PC, and thought, I truly don't know what to play anymore. Maybe I'm just outgrowing video games. I had a terrifying moment like that once, back in 2014. I had just graduated college and was going through what was effectively my last summer break before entering the cold world of adulthood. With the software engineering career on the horizon and an abundance of free time on my hands, I faced a huge dilemma. What video game would I binge play till 5 in the morning every day? The days where I could pop an old nostalgia classic into my Xbox and be satisfied were no longer. I had slain every dragon in Skyrim, closed every Oblivion Gate in Cyrodiil, and gone to every strip club in Los Santos. The open world and RPG genres started to wear thin on me. Sure, going on a murderous rampage in any of those games was usually a blast, but after years of doing it, my lust for chaos slowly diminished. And once that's gone, what's left? The quests? After enough of them, they all start to feel the same. Guy A wants you to go to point B to fetch item C, but be careful because there are a lot of generic enemy type Ds. Got the item? Great. Here's 100 gold. Now do the same thing 62 more times until the credits roll like a good little errand boy. Where was the challenge? Where was the spice? Where was that sense of triumph that the young gamer in me had felt all those years ago? Enter Dark Souls. Or, more specifically, Dark Souls 2. The best game in the Soul series by far, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Boo! Okay, okay. A game in the Dark Souls series. Better? Anyway, a friend of mine had mentioned Dark Souls 2 to me when we were hanging out one day. He described it as literally the hardest game he has ever played. LOL. Fucking casual. Being the superior gamer, I of course had to get my hands on this game now and beat it so I could rub it in his face just how bad he was at it. Before buying the game, I did the smart consumer thing and watched some gameplay videos on YouTube, and I have to say, I was not impressed. The combat was clunky, the graphics looked like something out of an Xbox 360 launch title, the creatures in this game which they call ogres were definitely not as handsome as Shrek, not even close. But all the reviewers online were saying it was a 9 out of 10 game, even IGN, and they've never been wrong about anything. So I went ahead and bought it. My opinion on the game within the first hour of playing didn't change much. I still hated the combat and thought the graphics were tacky but I did find the lore intriguing. The first character interaction you come across is with a group of hags in an area called Things Betwixt. This is where souls are first mentioned. They're this game's form of experience points and currency, which you get from killing enemies. The old ladies kept telling me how I will need souls, but also how I will lose them over and over and over again. Then they laughed in my face and kicked me out of their humble abode. Making it through things betwixt to arrive at the beautiful melancholy hub of Majula was nice. But that feeling went away once I talked to the Emerald Herald, who's the best waifu in the Soul series by the way, and saw the level up screen. I mean, what the hell is this? Is the screen for leveling up, or is this some kind of command screen from a 1960s historical fiction war movie? What are these abbreviations? What's this thing called ADP? I bet it's not really that important. After suppressing my urge to kill all the NPCs in the area, because apparently that's frowned upon in these games, I decided to explore. What's up this hill that I came from? What does this door-shaped hole in the side of the cliff lead to? Why are these three little pigs so aggressive, and goddammit, why are they the hardest things to kill in this game? They probably accounted for like three of my first deaths before I came to the conclusion I would need to become a level 200 god to take them out. Which brings me to the most intriguing thing about this game so far like the most intriguing thing about life, death. I spent all this time using the DS2 character creator to make this beautiful avatar, and after just one fatal encounter, my character became ugly again. They became this greenish brownish color, like my toilet after a night of eating tacos, and their voice sounded like a hobo on heavy opiates. <laughs> What's more, my health bar had this little notch at the end of it, signifying my max health was now reduced. And my soul count went to zero. What kind of hardcore game is this? You're punishing me for dying when I'm still trying to figure out this slow-ass combat? Come on, FromSoft, throw me a freaking homeward bone here. When you die, a puddle of blood with this glowing green ball on top appears in the spot of your death. What is this? A reminder of my shame? 
As much as it was that, turns out it serves a greater purpose. It's your souls. All the ones you lost from the last time you died. Because I had 275 souls when I died, that puddle now had 275 souls. But you gotta get them back quick, because if you die before you can get them back, they're gone forever into the void. And now, you can only retrieve the measly amount of souls you had in your previous attempt to save them, which in my case often meant zero. God, I hated this. But you know what? It grew on me. And over time, this mechanic became a fun little game within the game itself. I'd be in the middle of exploring the forest of fallen giants, and after slaying eight undead soldiers and amassing a thousand souls, boom! One of them stabs me right in the chest, causing me to die and drop all my souls. Ooh. Does that asshole really think he's gonna get away with this? I don't think so. What went from me exploring now became me on a mission to find this punk ass undead, get my souls back, and backstab him to high heaven with my longsword plus one. What a rush! What makes the stakes so high in this game versus a game like Skyrim is your inability to save scum. In Skyrim, when you're faced with a tough battle, you could just create a save slot mid-game, maybe even in the middle of combat, and reload the game whenever you want, whether it's because you died or ran through way more health potions than you intended to. Dark Souls laughs in the face of this premise and says, If he dies, he dies. The only way you as a player can save is by quitting the game, and unlike Skyrim, you can't create multiple save states. You're stuck with whatever your most recent one is, good or bad. The game has an autosave feature that runs periodically as you play, meaning any action or mistake you make, Dark Souls remembers. There are ways you can try to outsmart the system, like attempting to quit the game or turning off the console right before you die, but it's not guaranteed to work and may even result in a corrupted save. Talk about putting hair on your filthy gamer chest. This lack of saveability comes in the forefront during boss battles. You will die to bosses. A lot. And while you could always go back to the boss arena to recover your lost souls, it's best to spend all your souls beforehand so you're not stuck in a dilemma where you want to explore the world more, but you also need your 5,000 souls stuck by the last giant's feet. Speaking of bosses, how do they stack up? Well, if this were a comparison video of the bosses from the three Dark Souls games, the ones in this game would be a mm, bit of a mixed bag. But overall, the Soul series has a unique take on bosses that make them stand out from other games. They are these larger-than-life, twisted monsters with some convoluted story behind their existence. Unlike most other games, the boss fights in this game are rarely gimmicky. You won't find any, wait for the boss to bow down, then jump on their head three times, type fights here. With bosses having massive health pools and extremely hard hitting attacks, beating them comes down to a test of patience and pattern recognition. The first boss in DS2 is the last giant. He's a fitting first fight, as his attacks are slow and telegraphed, but still pack enough punch to deplete half your health bar. His stomps give you enough time to roll away, wait for the attack to finish, then come back and wail on him. Halfway through this fight, he decides, Fuck this guy and fuck myself! and rips off his arm and starts attacking you with it, giving him more range and adding some new moves to his arsenal. Overall, his fight is one of the weaker ones in the game, but he serves as an adequate Fizzbuzz test for newbies to the series. For those unfamiliar, Fizzbuzz is a test given to computer science graduates to see if they can actually code, or they just wasted 200,000 on a degree that taught them how to get homework answers from Google. Anyway, back to the game. The really, real get good check comes in the form of the next boss fight, the Pursuer. The Pursuer is this big ghost-like knight who loves charging you, comboing you, and will literally chase you to the end of the earth. Seriously, this guy hates you, I don't know why. Our character must have told him that spending thousands on a monkey-based NFT was a bad investment. Unlike the last giant, whose attacks have a large windup, the Pursuer strikes quickly, leaving little room for error. In his main attack, the Pursuer puts his sword at his side, charges at you, and swings it upwards. If you get caught, you get flung in the air and left vulnerable on the ground, as he smiles and wonders how he'll dice you up next. His next major attack is a three-part combo. Sideways slash, shield bash, then overhead slam. 
The tough part here is that he can choose to switch up his combo based on your reaction. If you run away too quickly when he starts the combo, he'll stop after one slash and prepare his next attack. If you choose to roll to his side and keep close after his first slash, he'll change up part three of the combo and unleash a spinning slash punishing you if you don't time your roll correctly, or get behind him. Making a mistake against him is costly as he is highly aggressive. If you get hit and move away to heal, good luck. He'll pick up on that right away and give you a good whacking. Panic healing does not work on him. If you need to heal, you'll need to bait a combo from him and time your heal as soon as the combo finishes so you're ready to dodge his next strike. While his attacks are telegraphed, you won't get them right away as a new player. It's a complete trial by fire. Best advice would be to just roll away every time he strikes until you get a better idea of his attack patterns and how he swings his sword. Once you get that down, you'll be better able to dodge to his side and punish him at the end of his attacks. The sense of achievement from overcoming a challenging boss like the Pursuer is what really makes the Souls game special. I can't tell you how many times I ran up to the Pursuer's arena on my first playthrough, only to get thrashed again and again. But on that what was probably 496th attempt, when I solved the Matrix and learned how to perfectly dodge his attacks and time my strikes, seeing his health bar reach zero as he wailed to the sky and dissipated was the best feeling I had ever felt in any video game in a very, very long time. And what did I get for this hard fought achievement? A metric boatload of souls. Oh yeah! Ah, souls. We've talked a lot about getting them, and losing them, but we haven't talked a lot about how to use them. As I mentioned earlier, they're this game's version of currency. You could use them to buy important items, whether they be something practical, like life gems for healing, or something that you can use to unlock a critical NPC, like how you could buy a key to unlock the blacksmith's workshop. But the vast amount of souls you get are gonna go to leveling up. Remember that intimidating screen we saw earlier? Yeah, it's time to revisit that. Much like fighting the bosses in this game, figuring out how to tailor your build on your first playthrough is going to be a matter of trial and error. The amount of build options in Souls games is insane, and while you may have chosen a starting class of Sorcerer or Knight, you will likely find your taste changing as you play through the game. I chose Swordsman the first time I played, that way I could become a dual-wielding whirling dervish of doom. But after I had chosen my starting class, I didn't really know what to do with my build. I picked up a bunch of cool looking armor sets, but when I tried them on, they either slowed me down or just outright exceeded my character's equipment load. I realized I would need to make sacrifices, either to my weapon of choice or to my desired stats in order to accommodate. Enter the stat screen. This game thankfully provides you with a help widget where you can select a given stat and the game will give you a brief description of what it does. This alone is not going to make things crystal clear, but for everything else, there's Fextra Life. Any Souls gamer who's not embarrassed to look things up online is intimately familiar with this site. It's a wiki managed by the Souls community that provides a breakdown of everything from stats to enemies to boss strategies to area walkthroughs, the whole nine yards. I looked at this passingly in my first playthrough and used it to make some of my decisions, but really I was using it for confirmation bias. I wanted to upgrade strength, so I confirmed it made my attack stronger and let me wield clubs bigger than Macho Man Randy Savage's left bicep. Perfect. This stat called Vitality allows me to have a higher equip load, which means more room for better armor? Sure, I'll take that. Dex makes me a glorified katana-wielding weeboo? Bingo, I'll take 20. What started as a swordsman build was slowly becoming a well-rounded knight build. I was extremely nervous at this point about over-specializing my character and having it come back to bite me. So, I also threw a couple of points into faith, attunement, and intelligence, even though I never ended up using magic. As I played through the game, I became really unimpressed with the amount of help that armor was. It seemed even with decent armor, I could still get one shot by enemies like the ogre. I was also getting a lot better at the whole recognizing enemy attack patterns and dodging at the right time thing. So I figured, why not go full glass cannon? And that's exactly what I did. 
I ditched vitality and went full on strength, dex, and vigor. I'd previously given up on a left-handed weapon when I started wearing heavy armor. But now, it was back to just me, my bare pecs, and my dual-wielding swords. My swordsman was back in action, and all it took was me messing up my stat allocation 17 times. The dopamine rush you get from figuring out how to allocate stats and learn how to make whatever build you want is not unlike the sense of achievement you get from beating bosses. Souls games have a steep learning curve, and once you get over that initial hump, it's smooth sailing from there on out. There remains one thing you probably won't figure out though. It's the trademark of every Souls game, the cryptic lore. When I say Dark Souls 2 does not hold your hand, that doesn't just apply to gameplay. That applies to the story, too. You'll get a plot-based cutscene here and there, maybe at the beginning and the end of the game, but that's about it. The story is like a jigsaw puzzle, with the pieces scattered across the kingdom. And it's up to you, a lowly beef jerky undead, to put them all together. Bits of lore are told to you in two major ways, through the item descriptions and through dialogue with other NPCs. On my first playthrough, I barely paid attention to the item descriptions. Over time, I slowly started to remind myself whenever I picked up a weapon, oh yeah, I should probably check which anime edgelord killed which kaiju with this. Sometimes the item descriptions will reveal small bits of lore. Other times, it'll just give you a really cheeky item description like, this weapon is totally useless. Why did you even pick it up? You're a failure, both to your parents and to yourself. This duality of mystery and cheekiness applies to the NPCs too. Most will tell you a contained story about the realm, like how you have to slay the four old ones to progress. Others take a much more saucy approach. My favorite is Strayed of Olafus, this cloaked sorcerer you find in the Lost Bastille. He might tell you about how the last witch of Izalith created pyromancy at the dawn of time. Or he may laugh in your face and tell you what a weakling you are. Feeble, cast one. Let's hope the magnificence of my spells does not deter you. <laughs> when it comes to other games, I usually prefer a well-told story that's spoon-fed to me, as opposed to one that tries to be overly complex and expects me to have the superior IQ of a Rick and Morty fan. In Dark Souls, though, a game with an oppressive, bleak atmosphere that can make you feel totally alone, I like the hands-off approach to the story. It's really quite unique, and something that sets its storytelling apart from other RPGs. If you ever want to know more about Souls lore, tune in to Vatividia's channel on YouTube. If anyone solved the mystery of life in Dark Souls games, it's him. Now that we've covered some of the fundamentals of Souls games, how exactly did this cure my gaming depression? Not to be confused with clinical depression. If you have that, please talk to a doctor. A video game won't treat that, regardless of what Reddit tells you. But, if you ever feel like you're getting bored of modern AAA titles and are in desperate need of a fresh, RPG experience that quenches your thirst for old-school arcade-like challenges, Souls games are your nirvana. The Souls retrieval mechanic, the punishing bosses, the build variety, and the unique take on lore all make this game something any hardcore gamer needs to experience at least once in their lives. I know from my personal experience, it saved me from getting bored of video games and pursuing another hobby, and why would anyone ever want to do that? Souls games have taken over the most recent chapter of my gaming life as my personal favorites, and with FromSoft's most highly anticipated game, Elden Ring, aka Big Dark Souls, aka Dark Souls 2 2, on its way, I couldn't be any happier. Thanks for watching, guys. If you're a gamer with a passing interest in Souls games, I hope this video brought to light what me and so many other people find special about these games, aside from just the difficulty. If you're a hardcore Souls fan and wondering why I'd post a video like this in 2022, well, it's because I wanted to get my thoughts on this beloved franchise out to the world. I'm tired of lurking in the shadows while other people release their boss ranking videos and DS2 bashing videos. Also. I wanted to get on the Elden Ring hype train, so I gotta establish myself in the Souls YouTube community before that. There are a number of mechanics in this video which I didn't get to, like the healing and the PvP, uh, but I just wanted to cover the mechanics that I value the most. 
If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. I'll publish more content like this. If you have something you'd like to say, whether it's how Dark Souls games got you through a rut in your life, uh, gaming or otherwise, or you want to make fun of me for how much I love Dark Souls 2, uh, go ahead in the comments below. I won't stop you. I'm Nikki 9 pins uh, If you're wondering why that's my YouTube name, you could check out my bio. It'll provide a small explanation of why that is. But again, thank you for watching, and may you have a day that's as magical as my dark pyromancer build. Peace.